Hey, Amen. Well, it's good seeing everybody here and down at the cafe. Um, it's our second week, and today we're just talking about how important it is to have wisdom. That having wisdom is better than gold, money, anything else in which you can receive. Now, there was a barber, and he had a couple customers in his shop, and a little boy. And so he said to the one customer, he said, this boy is the dumbest kid I've ever known. He goes, I'm going to prove it. So he had the boy come to him, and he said, now listen, I have a dollar in this hand, and I have two quarters in this hand. He said, which would you like? Well, the boy reached out, and he took the two quarters. So after he walked away, uh, the barber said, he never learns. Uh, well, so the customer walked out and saw the boy coming out of an ice cream shop. And he said, hey, Sonny, he said, I want to ask you a question. Why did you take the two quarters instead of the dollar bill? And the boy said, oh, it's real easy. He said, the day I take the dollar, the game is over. <laughs> well, some people are as dumb as a fox, right? <laughs> All right, let's look at wisdom. Um, we make our decisions, then our decisions make us. We are today who we are because of decisions we made yesterday, right? And in the future, we are going to be where we are because of the decisions that we're making today. Now, as we look, read over some very important verses of Scripture, I would like everyone here in the cafe, let's all stand. I would like you <coughs> to read this with me out loud. <coughs> Before we read the first one, uh, there was King Solomon, and, and it was the day of sacrifice. They were sacrificing bulls. Well, he sacrificed a thousand bulls. Well, God showed up. When you do something in a big way, showing God that you mean business on steroids, then God shows up. So God said, now listen, you can have anything you want. And Solomon said this. Okay, read out loud. Second Chronicles 1.10, everyone. Give me wisdom and knowledge that I may lead this people. He didn't ask for money, didn't ask for fame. God gave him wisdom then all the rest followed. Now, let's go to Proverbs 16, verse 16. Everyone, how much better to get wisdom than gold, to get insight rather than silver. Uh, here it says that more than silver than gold, wisdom is the most valuable commodity. Okay, now let's all read Proverbs 4, verse 7. The beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom, though it cost all you have, get understanding. Okay, you may be seated. Notice there, it said, pay the price of whatever you have to do to get wisdom and understanding, wisdom and knowledge. Uh, one of my children, uh, they finished up high school, and just like a lot of teenagers, there was a lot of confusion going on there. Uh, and they, they weren't doing real well in school, and I, I just didn't know what was going to happen. Well, here they made the decision that they wanted to go to Word of Life. Word of Life is up uh, New York State, up in the mountains, uh, up by Canada. There's nothing there except the school. I mean, you got the, uh, you know, the deer and the birds and the bear and this school. That's it. So you go there, you get alone with God, and what they do, they have the best Bible teachers theologians, I mean, people that are world-renowned, and they'll come up there for two to four weeks, teach a course, and then that next one comes. Well, I was not in agreement with this because I wanted him maybe <clears throat> to go down to Liberty where he'd be taking regular courses and also Christian courses. Uh, and I was afraid we were just wasting money on credits that couldn't be transferred. Well, he really wanted to do this, and so he went up there for one year, but when he came back the next year, he was a whole new young man. And I thought that one year of investment was the best year of his life. We need young people. And I'm just telling you, do not get me wrong because I look like a hypocrite when I'm going to say, as you know, my wife and I, we got married very, very young. But I am one of the parents that will tell you we did this, don't do what we did, and we're passing wisdom on to you. Now, for us, it worked out well. How many of you 
we're married very young, or you married your, uh, your, your sweetheart from high school. How many here? Okay, yeah, you know, I see. I'm seeing this a lot with our older crowd here, and, uh, and that's true, and in that day, those things happen, but did you know that over 90% of all couples that marry their high school sweetheart end up in a divorce? Did you know that? Okay, you need that time when you're done with school to try to figure out what to do with your life. To get to know what it is I believe. The world holds all these values. What values are you going to hold? Very, very important to seek after wisdom and to pay a price for it. How many of you would say, if I knew then what I know now, I would have done things so much more differently? Anybody? Okay, most of us, right? Why? Because we gain wisdom over the years. Okay, I do not want to say that you're a fool. You can figure it out yourself, okay? So here we are. Fools act before they think. People who have bad tempers and go flying off the mouth. Bad words. and They're fools. Always. Always fools. They act before they think. Now look at me in Proverbs 13 verse 16. All who are prudent, meaning those who are successful, act with knowledge, but fools expose their folly. So they, they act on knowledge, and, 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 but fools, will, they'll just do things on a whim. Do you remember th this picture here? Remember the 60s and 70s? Anybody lived through those years? Okay. We thought we looked good back then, didn't we? We, we didn't know we looked like fools. All I have to say, at least our pants weren't falling down. I just have to say that one. Okay, number two. Fools spend all they earn. Proverbs 21, verse 20. The wise stores up choice food in olive oil and food for the future, puts away. But fools gulp theirs down. Okay, now don't raise your hand on this. In fact, what I, want you to, I, I want you to smile. Now, I can't see those of you down at the cafe... I know some of you smiling right now. Don't smile. And up here, don't smile, okay? Without answering. So if this is you, then you can give me a big grin. Okay, ready? Okay, here we go. Um, how many of you live paycheck to paycheck? Meaning if you don't get the next paycheck, you can't pay your bills. Good. Give me a big toothy grin. Okay, I see some. Wow, there's not many. Liar, liar, pants on fire. Do you want to know the truth of this? In the church and outside of the church, 80%, 80% of all people are living paycheck to paycheck. And if you miss one paycheck, you cannot pay your bills. 80%. That's pretty shocking, isn't it? Oh, it gets worse. Those who are 65 years old, and you're going to retire. Half of America at 65, not younger, at 65, they are now going to be dependent upon a fixed income. Have loans. Imagine that. Oh, man, I'm sorry. Whoops. Messed up here. Have no money in their savings. It's worse. They don't have $1 in savings. They have no money in a 401k. They have absolutely no savings. All half of all 65-year-old people that are going into retirement. Pretty shocking, isn't it? There are 3 million people, which there's more statistics with this, but 3 million people that are over 60 years of age who are still paying their college loans off. They still owe on their college loans, and they are 60 years of age. This is getting worse. 70% of all people between 65 and 74, okay, take all people, 65 years old to 74. Now, men, I want you to realize, they estimate the average man's going to die about 76 now. In fact, the age has risen a little bit, and so, um, but 76, so from 65 to 74, 70% of those people are paying on a loan or loans. Wait a minute. At 65, shouldn't we have all of our loans paid off? Shouldn't we? Right? I mean, we're going to retirement. 
We're going to be on a fixed income. Most people are going to at least half of their income. Shouldn't we be debt free? Okay, imagine 70% all the way to 74, not between there, all the way to 74 still have loans. So if you're a man and you live to be 76, you get two years of being debt free. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> Only two years before you go home to, to be with God. Yeah, we're, we're really messed up financially. Fools spend all they earn. Fools, number three, hurt those they love. What's that old saying? You don't bite the hand that feeds you. Proverbs 14, verse 1. The wise woman builds her house, but with her own hands, a foolish one tears hers down. And how do we do that? We, we do it through a divorce. Half of America is divorced. Half of all couples that are getting married are getting, going to get divorced. My wife was in the church service last night. I pointed her out, and I said to her, I will not divorce you because I am not giving you half. This isn't happening. Most people at the end of a divorce have lost everything they own. Isn't this true? You say, well, I want to be happy. Now, don't get me wrong. The pastors together agree when somebody needs to get a divorce. So there are people in a rightful situation that they should divorce. But you know, 90% of people shouldn't get a divorce. You're just divorcing because you don't like that person. Well, so what? Yeah, just live with them. I'm not giving up half. I'm not to... How many of you would say, I've worked too hard for what I have right now. Even if you were divorced before, I've worked now too hard. Do you know what I'm saying here? It's hard to build a life, isn't it? It's hard. It's hard to own a home. It's hard to get yourself financially ahead. It takes years to get there. And then out of some stupid fleshly desire, we're going to sell everything out. We hurt those that we love. It's just very sad. Let me give you more. Ready? Ladies, 45%, 45 to 50% of all the women in the church right now, you've either cheated on your husband one time, and I'm not talking about texting, I'm talking about sleeping with somebody one time in your marriage. 50 to 60% of all married men cheat on their wives one time while they're married. There is no difference in this statistic in the church or outside the church right now. That's pretty sad. And why? Because, and we're going to talk about this today, because as believers, we're living like fools. You know God, your name's in the book of life, but you live like a fool. You live like a fool, you act like a fool, you look like the world, you act like the world. This was not true 25 years ago, but it's true right now. We see no difference. Very, very sad. Very, it's very, it bothers the pastors, it bothers me, it just is very, very disturbing. Fools think they know it all. And, and let me just get back here. There's someone here right now. I know the Lord wants me to say this. You're involved in something right now you shouldn't be involved in. You got somebody on Facebook. You're going out to lunch. You ought not ever to go out to lunch with somebody of the opposite sex by yourself. Never. Unless it's your grandma. You know? You need to bring it in. There's going to be some little boy, some little girl with tears running down their face. And you hurt them. Because there's something you wanted. Hey, let, let, let's talk about this whole sexual thing just for a minute. Really, is it worth it? Is this really worth it? To destroy your life, ruin your testimony, giving your family a bad name, it's not worth it. Number four, four fools think they know it all. They just know it all. See, see that picture, that guy up there? I, I drew that. That's what some of my counseling people look like. So I tells them, ooh, then I got to listen to the thing you say. You can show them all the facts. They still don't care. Look, Proverbs chapter 12, verse 15. The way of a fool seems to be right to them, but the wise listen to advice. Okay, I want to talk. 
I promise, I won't go down this rabbit trail real long, but I want to talk about what is a sensitive subject. It's not sensitive to me, because we have to speak the truth. Did you know that the morals of the Word of God and how to live righteous lives, this makes sense. So we do what God tells us to do, if we agree with it or not, because we're to be obedient to God. But here, I'm telling you, in Jesus' name, in the area of morality, in Christian living, this makes common sense and agrees with all the facts. So what I'm going to do right now, I, I'm just going to, I'll, I'll mark my place. I'm going to shut my Bible. Some of you don't like it, but I want to step aside right now just as a human being. Let's talk about the gay lifestyle. Now, what I'm going to say here, I challenge you, check this out. Check it out. When I became a Christian, I wasn't raised in a Christian home. But I found out what the Bible taught, this makes sense. The average gay man only lives to his early 40s. And it's not only because of AIDS. There's many other reasons, and one of them is suicide. I got news for you. It doesn't work. They're not happy, and they're at the top of the most miserable people upon the face of the earth. There's nothing gay about the gay lifestyle. Now, before I send a rage out into people in the congregation, I want you to listen to me real close, because that means you have somebody that you love that's in this lifestyle or going in this lifestyle, so you need to hear this. If I have the knowledge, the absolute facts, you can check this one out. This is, you can look at all different sources, and you can say early to mid 40, 45 years, we'll say at the latest. So a gay man on the average is going to die 30 years premature. Okay, now let's just rest on that fact. So somebody says, well, you know, this person was born gay. Okay, whatever stupid excuse you want to use. Does life have to be all about sex? Really? I, I don't know about you. First of all, I don't want to hear about people's sexual orientation. I just don't care. I don't want to hear it. Let me tell you one more thing. Ready? We talk about this lifestyle, and we should be accepting of this. Have you seen their parades? Are you hiding in your house, and you're not looking what's going on at their parades? If you have a decent bone in your body, you cannot take your child to a gay pride parade. It is so filthy. It is so dirty. It is so profane of what they're doing, how they're dressing, what's on their signs, and little props they're carrying with them, you'd be a very bad parent to take your child there. Now, let me tell you, if you can't take them to the gay parade, don't you think there's something wrong? We're not talking about some. We're talking about all. Okay, but let me even go a little further. If I know that the average gay man is going to die, I'm a pastor, I'm a father. Okay, I have brothers. So my brother, he says, let's say he says he's gay. Let's say well, your child says they, they're gay. Let's say can I stand behind them when I know that the average person is going to die in their early 40s? No. I cannot, and I will not. So, of course, what they want to throw out, you're mean. You guys are cruel. You're uncaring. No, I turn it around. You're uncaring. You don't care about them. Here's the message. Good. I hope you die. I hope you die. I don't care you die early. Go have a good time in the next few years. So if you have a child that's 30 years old that you could look and say, good, I hope you enjoy the next 13 years of your life. I hope that they're wonderful. No, we, we can't do that. Now, if you're lacking that knowledge, that makes sense. But fools don't want to hear knowledge. Amen. They don't want to hear it. They don't care. You can talk to your blue in the face and they'll say, well, you guys are mean and you're cruel and I'm accepting of these people. No, you don't care about these people. Would you tell someone, listen, I know that in time heroin's going to kill you, but if you really want heroin, baby, I mean, I just want you on heroin. I mean, just go shoot it up and have a good time and we're just going to have a coming out heroin party. We're just going, oh, this is just wonderful. What kind of stupidity are we living in? Listen, it's foolish. It's foolish. It's uneducated. It doesn't make sense. And these are absolute facts. Now listen, I hate to step away from the Word of God, but the Word of God makes sense. And God knows that that lifestyle is no good. But a fool, they just seem it's right in their own minds. Okay, how do I get wisdom? First of all, you have to fear God. It's one of our problems here, Proverbs 9 verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. How people say, 
you know, they'll say, you know, I'm, a, I'm free in Christ. I live under grace. And as a believer, I can kind of do pretty much anything I want to do because my name's in the Lamb's Book of Life. Where do you get that from? No, you can't. Listen, your name's in the Book of Life and you're going to heaven. But I have found firsthand that if I'm disobedient to God and I stay there, he's taken me to the woodshed. Anybody, you've been taking the woodshed, you know what I'm talking about. So yeah, I spent some time here. I learned my lesson. We're supposed to fear God. But a lot of our homes, a lot of people aren't fearing God. You ought to talk differently as a Christian. So now if you're a Christian, you've carried your filthy, vulgar mouth into your Christian life. You're swearing in front of your children. You're swearing in front of other people. You're a Christian. Did you know when you get to heaven, did you know that there is what is known as the book of words? Did you know that? Because we're to talk differently. Get our tongues under control. Okay, not only that, what about the music you listen to? You become a Christian. You ought not to be playing that vulgar music anymore. You, you ought to listen to Christian music. One that honors and glorifies God. What about your television shows? You, no believer should ever pay for that filth to come into their house. Now, I'm gonna, I just want to talk to you young couples. You think, well, you know, we're young and we're married and, you know, you know, he wants to look at pornography, and as long as we do this together, it's okay. Listen, it's not okay. You're putting bad things in your husband's mind. Don't do that. We ought not to be watching movies where there's sex scenes, and your children know they're watching. Listen, don't do that. Listen, we, we got to start living Christian lives, and uh, holiness, and, and, and being fear of, of God, and you know, putting other people before ourselves. Okay, number two, if you, if you want wisdom, ask God for wisdom. James chapter one, verse five. If any of you last, uh, lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. You need to take time to go into the classroom of silence. Weeks ago, Pastor Sam spoke about sending up text prayers to God all throughout the day, and that's good. But there should be a holy time each day you get alone with God. Now, I'm going to be a friend. I, I was a pretty simple kid. So when I came to know the Lord, my pastor told me, God will lead you into blessings if you obey his word. So I was behind in school, and so I started reading my Bible every day. And I started spending a long time every day with the Lord in prayer and asking for his will. I have found this. If you want to know by Friday what God's will is, he'll tell you. Now, it may take 10 years to get there, right? But you can know his will. So I was 15 years old. I just prayed and prayed and prayed and said, God, I want you to show me what you want me to do. Okay, then God gave me this desire, and that's another whole subject, but I just gave it to him. I kept praying and praying. It was confirmed, and I knew very quickly what I was going to do for the rest of my life. So I went off to Bible college, and when I got to Bible college, um, they were talking about starting churches all over America. So I prayed, and I want to know quick. I want to know fast. God let me know. I said, where do you want me to plant a church? And God planted this city in my heart to do that. You have to hunt and search for years, months, like it's some sort of divine Easter bunny hunt. But you've got to spend time with God, right? Ask God, he'll tell you. But the problem is we're not asking God. Number three, very important, hang out with wise people people. Look here, Proverbs 13, verse 20. Walk with the wise and become wise. For a companion of fools suffers harms. If you're walking with idiots, you're going to become an idiot. If you're hanging out with people who are broke all their life, you're going to be broke all your life. If you hang out with people, they're lazy. They, they have no passion. They have no vision. You're going to turn out like they're lazy, sorry butts. You're going to be just like them. I'll tell you, I, I, I mean this. I, 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 uh, I have never seen a generation of lazy people like I am seeing today. It's just getting worse by the year. I, I worked for a farmer, so I asked him when I was 14 years old, 15, well, what time do you want me to work? He goes, you have to be at work when the sun comes up. I said, okay, I came to work. I said, well, what time do we work till? 
He goes, we work out in the fields till the sun goes down. Well, I saw he did real well. That, that set me up for life to be a really hard worker. Now, I'm not that young anymore, but I'm still working this schedule. And I'm dealing with people that are poor and people can't pay their bills and complaining. Because what am I going to do? I have a 40-hour week job. Well, go work another 20 hours. Just do what you got to do. But we're, we're, we're living in a generation where, well, my brother does it. My friends don't do it. You know, I hate booze. If you haven't been around here long enough, you haven't heard about it. Well, you're going to hear about it right now. <laughs> Boozers are losers. Okay, now, before you walk out, <laughs> Pastor Sam, Pastor Ron, and Pastor Mike grew up in homes that were destroyed by alcohol. I deal with people constantly that have problems. The drug epidemic out there is bad, but it's not as bad as the alcohol problem. Alcohol is the really cool primrose path that leads to drugs. If you have a family of five, and mom and dad are like really cool, and they're good people, and they like to socially drink, and you have three children, and you say, hey, here's a yellow light with caution, you can drink too one of your children are going to end up being an alcoholic. Now, let me ask you something. Is that worth it? Really? Is that worth it? I had conversations like this mega years ago. I've never changed on this subject. So we had an upstanding, public-figured family that came to my church. Good people. They got saved. And they said, you know, we love the church, but really bothers us that you talk about this alcohol. They go, we have a little bar in our home. We don't even drink. But when people come to our house, we offer them a drink. I guess they're not having too many Christians over. Back in that day, I didn't know too many Christians that drank. Not today, but whatever. When we have parties, we offer alcohol. And they said, so why are you making a big deal out of this? Because I was embarrassing them in front of their children. So I said, listen, I know you two have it together. I know you love the Lord. I know you mean well. But you have a yellow light of caution for your children. You don't know something could happen to those kids. They didn't want to hear it, and they just continued. They came to my church. I loved that family and the kids, and they were good kids and everything. And I did both their children's funeral over booze. Was that worth it? I had another lady. She started dating this guy. She was a good girl. This guy was a loser. Boozer, loser. I mean, not just slightly drinking. So I told her, I said, you got to marry him. She goes, oh, everybody drinks. I said, I don't care if they drink or not. Well, she married him anyhow. Well, he continued, got worse. Then he had some children. Constant then I asked her to please leave him. I said, leave him now. Get your children away from him now. Because I saw what was happening with the boys. I buried him, and I buried the children. Okay, you're talking to the wrong person. Okay, this is the number one problem we deal with in the church. And it is very disturbing when people receive the knowledge, but we continue down this path. And the reason why is you're impressing a crowd that you shouldn't be with. And you need to get away from them and cut that off. And now step up. You say, but Pastor Mike, I go to a high-class bar. Do you know the difference between a high-class uh, club and some low-class bar? One just stinks worse than the other one. Amen. Okay, I'm like, how old are you? How old? You go in there, are those your people? If those are your people, when Jesus comes, you will be left behind. How long does it take somebody who's saved to decide who's my crowd? Who are you catering to? Well, you want to look around that establishment, you want to become some old bar fly, some little lounge lizard. While you're walking in there, would you like your daughter to come in and marry one of the guys at this establishment, one of your sons? I remember one of my boys, they brought this girl home from a date. They were adults. She came in. She had something on real, real low cut and something real tight, and the stomach was all bare. She had on this real short dress, high heels. He goes, Dad, well, would, she's a real pretty girl. He goes, what, what do you think? I said, uh, all I have to say is your mama never swung on a bar stool. You marry something that swings on a bar stool, 
you will end up in a divorce. I'm just laying this one out. But it's time for Christians to go home and say, you know what, we're, we're going to dump the booze. You say you love Jesus and you're drinking. Listen, what are you doing? Knock it off. It's just stupid. Listen, it's stupid. It's immature. I'm just telling you straight here because I truly am trying to help you because they started at that. Do you, do you think people one day just decide, decide you know what, I'm going to get on some heavy drug? Oh, no, 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 no. It starts with a beer. Listen, you don't need drugs. I don't need drugs to feel good. I am a drug. <laughs> you say, I'm afraid, of, I'm afraid of losing my friends. Hmm. You never had a real friend. A friend challenges you to be better, right? And young person, when you come to me and you say, now, Pastor Mike, I mean, these guys are my friends, but... You know, they do that, and I don't do that because uh, I'm, I'm like the designated driver. You know what you're telling me? You're saying, my friends are such out-of-control losers. When they go out at night, they can't even drive their car home, and that's why I'm there. You shouldn't be with those people. You need new friends. You just need some new friends. Amen. And I, now, listen, I'm telling you right now, you can find a pastor out there. We get some really good local ones here right now. They're keeping beer in the refrigerator. This just started over the last five years. Yeah, I'll tell them straight through their face. I'll stick their names on our website. I'll tell you, this is ticking me off. I mean, how dare you? What is wrong with you? Okay, I promise I'll get off that subject. Oh, well, so what does it all boil down to? When I was young, I didn't have a family. I worked for this farmer. He loved God. He said, Mike, he goes, you know, I don't make as much money as you think. He said, but I take care of my children, and we have this little farm here. He goes, but I work hard. I work hard, and I give Jesus the first 10% of all my money. And he goes, that's what you do. And I said, okay, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to work hard for God. Put him number one. Real simple. So then I start looking at this other guy, and he had a wife and some younger children. He loved his wife. He loved his children. I watched him spank his kid, children, hug them, spank them, discipline them, according to the word of God. And I said, I like that. That's what I'm going to do. Okay, then I went to college. I came to Pittsburgh, start my church. I never really knew my grandpa. I got to know him one year before he died. He accepted Christ that year. And I found out he had some money. So I took me over to his house. I'm glad he did this. He goes, hey, Mike, you see that car over there? I said, yeah. He said, that's a brand new car. I wrote a check out for it last week. I said, wow. I said, how did you do this? Okay, listen to me. You don't have to take a Dave Ramsey course. Ready? This is what he said to me. He said, Mike, this is what you do. You should have two loans in your life. You should have a school loan. Go to school as cheap as you can, which, which I did that. He goes, the second thing is you get a house loan. You never put a house loan longer than 15 years. He said, so if you're 24, if you're 30, 25 years old, you put on a 15-year loan, by the time you're 40 years of age, you are debt-free for the rest of your life, and you'll have all this extra money. I said, wow, okay. He only had to tell me one time, and that was it. Okay, then I went down to Jerry Falwell School, down to Liberty University. So the founder, Jerry Falwell, he told us, he said, this is what you do, you you go to a city, he goes, nobody wants to support you, just go out there and move into a shack. I said, okay, yes, sir, that's what I'm going to do, and that's what I did. He said, now, when you go to that church, he said, I want you to make a decision that you're going to die at that church. He goes, I want generations to know that there is a preacher that doesn't run around here, run there, run here, just stays there leading people to Jesus, and you'll build a great ministry. And I did that. I am the longest lasting, I think I've already said, pastor, priest, rabbi, anybody in the city. Because I listened to what Jerry told me. I listened to what the old farmer told me. I, I listened to what that young guy raising his children told me. And my grandpa concerning money. This, why? Because you hang out with wise people. You see what they do and you just model what they do. It's easy, right? It is. Just make that decision. I want to be a wise person. Jerry Falwell went to church one day to his church office. He keeled over dead in the office working. I like that. I, like, I, want to, I want to die in my office because I want Pastor Sam and Pastor Ron have to clean the mess up. <laughs> I, I've got to pray. 
when I get older, I'm going to pray that I'm going to know when I'm going to die. And, and that day, I'll pre-purchase my coffin. And I'm hoping it's going to be on a Sunday. And if it's on a Sunday, what I'm going to do, I'm going to pull in for that service my, my coffin right up the steps there. I'm going to set it up in the back on wheels. And then I'm going to preach my sermon. And then I'm going to get in the coffin. I'm going to sit in the coffin. And I'm going to say something like this. I'm going to say, uh, let's see my last words. Uh, only one life will soon be passed. And what's only done for Christ will last when one more. I'm going to say, that's all, folks. And then I'm going to close the lid. Okay, I want to tell you one final story here about decisions, the importance of making decisions with your, in front of your children. They haven't gotten, now listen, I know some people are a little upset right now, and it's okay. Um, and it, listen, if you're really, really mad, go after Ron, go after Sam and tell him off. <laughs> <laughs> or you can, you can email me about it. It's my email address, write this down. It's I don't give a rip.com, okay? <laughs> okay, so... Chicago's O'Hare International Airport is named after Butch O'Hare, national hero during World War II. He was in a fighter plane, and, and, and he had just taken off just minutes before, before from the uh, aircraft carrier, ten, uh, carrier, the Lexington. And um, so he's flying, and there he sees nine Japanese bombers ready to take out the Lexington. And he took them on, risked his life, using his own plane as like a weapon to take the planes out. It's a long story, but he succeeded. National hero. Wow, what guts. Where's that come from? Well, he was from Chicago. And you know, just a few years before that, about five years before, there was a man by the name of Easy Eddie. Very, very successful lawyer. Multi-millionaire. He only had one client, and his name was Al Capone. And he kept Al Capone and his mob out of jail. Then Easy Eddie one day came to know God. And they looked at his children, and he realized it was going to get out the dirty, filthy name that he had. Easy Eddie, Al Capone's lawyer, is the one who turned him into the authorities with all the evidence to put him in jail. Al Capone sent a message back to him, and he said, you are now going to die in Easy Eddie prepared. Then he was gunned down on the streets of Chicago. When the police got there, and they got into his wallet and opened it up, this is what they found in Easy Eddie's wallet. The clock of life is wound but once, and no man has the power to tell just when that hand will stop at late or early hour. Oh, to lose one's wealth is sad indeed. To lose one's health is more. Oh, but to lose one's soul is such a loss that no man can restore. You say, well, that doesn't sound like great success because he died in the end. Oh, no. He was very successful because his son was Butch O'Hare. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, right now in Jesus' name, oh God, I pray that we make the right decisions. Let's have every head bowed, every eye closed. There's someone here and you need to trust in Christ right now. If you don't know where, where you're going to spend eternity, I want you to pray with me right now. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe with all my heart that you died on that cross for me. I believe you shed your blood I believe you arose from the grave. And right now, at this moment, I repent of my sins. And I ask you to save me right now. With every head bowed, every eye closed, if you just prayed that, please put your name on a connection card so we can talk to you about this. Oh, now, Father, Father, I pray in Jesus' name. I pray, Father, that we would get wisdom. I pray that we would do whatever we have to do to get wisdom. I pray that we would pay whatever price we need to pay to be wise. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.